All right. There we go. Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for being here tonight. What a great uh, lesson we have this week. John 15 has always been one of my favorites, but it's also a, a challenging lesson. So uh, we're going to get into some, hopefully, some good stuff tonight. Um, I want to remind you again, this is, <clears throat> the countdown is uh, T minus one week to our Sharing the Gospel seminar. It's coming up uh, next Monday at 5.45 p.m. Uh, so if you uh, are feeling led to uh, learn a little bit more about what it means to share the gospel, how I can do it, um, we don't have all the answers, but we do have uh, a great seminar to just help you think about um, when those opportunities come, um, that can I step in and bear some fruit, right? Um, how, can I, how can I be more fruitful um, with sharing the gospel? Okay, uh, the aim this uh, week is remaining in Christ produces fruit and love, but it also provokes opposition. Remaining in Christ produces fruit and love, but it also provokes, provokes opposition. The doctrine is the church, and the attribute of God is love. So let's, let's pray, and then we'll get started. Lord God, we thank you for uh, the teaching you have tonight uh, on, on how we can be more fruitful for you. Uh, you desire that we bear fruit for you. And Lord, help us to understand what that looks like. Help us understand how we can uh, be better servants uh, because of what you've done for us. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So the divisions tonight... I, uh, I picked out our, our bearing much fruit, that's division one, and then uh, worldly opposition is, is the next one. And you might be getting tired of this slide, but I, I just want to, again, ground us that we're still hanging out between the Last Supper and the Garden of Gethsemane, and, and theologians call this the upper room discourse. Uh, so we're, we're getting a lot of uh, teachings from Jesus here. Um, last week, uh, the disciples were given the promise of the Holy Spirit, and that not only was, was with them, but will soon be in them. And then he gave us a definition of what it means to love. If you love me, you're going to obey my commands. And we're going to see that again, again tonight. And then if you remember, he gave them his peace. Not that the world gives, but he gave them his peace. Um, so tonight, uh, we're going to get more into what Jesus is, is telling his disciples uh, so if you go to uh, chapter 15, verse 1, um, and it says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Not just any vine, but the true vine. Israel, you see, they, they'd be able to distinguish between Jesus' claim as a true vine as just any vine, because in Isaiah, we started Isaiah last year, Isaiah 5, verse 7 says this, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. The true, true vine means that all other vines are imitations, right? It's a simple but great illustration. You see, grapes need the vine. All the nourishment comes from the vine. The ability to bear fruit comes from the vine. The genetics all come from the vine. And so Jesus is taking that something that is, that is commonly known to the people and he's applying it to himself. He's saying, I am the true vine. And he says, my father is the gardener. Uh, the father plays an important role. In Isaiah, that same chapter, in chapter 5, it says, it starts out, I will sing for the one I, a love song about his vineyard. God is, again, showing that he can use the analogy of a vineyard to himself. And later on, he says in that passage, he says, he looked for a crop of good grapes, but only saw bad fruit. It's talking about Israel. Um, we studied that last year in the divided kingdom. Which leads us to verse 2, which says, um, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Now, uh, there's a couple of different takes on this verse. One thinks it's, it's, it's believers that aren't bearing fruit. And the other one is that, no, this is unbelievers because he's, God would never cut off uh, a believer. You see, as born-again believers, we have the Holy Spirit that was promised last week living inside of us, um, 
And the Bible promises that God is not going to cast us aside. So I think it's more on the, the, the zero faith believers or the zero fruit uh, people who maybe claim to be there. Um, true believers, they long to serve their master, don't they? True believers would even lay down their life for their master. So if a true believer, uh, is it possible for a true believer to not bear fruit? I don't think so. Uh, You know, it's true that we're all still selfish. We sin daily. Uh, We struggle to put others' needs in front of ours. Uh, But there's a desire there to bear fruit for our Savior. Um, There's a lot of people in this world that claim to be believers but are not. Um, They may or may not be maybe identifying with their parents or or somebody else's religion. They don't want to be called an atheist. Uh, But there's zero visible fruit. And I believe that before God actually cuts off these branches, He's given them every opportunity to hit their knees and repent um, and truly believe. We should be praying for those people uh, in verse 2. But then it goes on to say this. It says that while every branch that does not bear, or I'm sorry, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it'll be even more fruitful. So now we're talking about believers who are already bearing fruit for the king, and God's not going to let us stay there, is he? He's not going to let us stay in that, in that comfortable place. Um, even if we're bearing some fruit there, he's going to prune us so that we're more fruitful. In fact, sometimes when we're bearing fruit um, and we're, we're just really happy with, with our situation uh, and how we're serving God, boom, here comes some more pruning. Um, so what is pruning? It really is uh, uh, just maybe some sanctification, but we get a little bit of a hint in Hebrews 12. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. So why does God prune us? Because he loves us. Hebrews goes on to say that God disciplines us for our good so that we can share in his holiness. So let's explore some pruning here. Um, Can consequences to sin be considered pruning? I think so. I think God can use anything in our life, even if it's a consequences to a sin choice that we made or somebody else made, God can use it. We see it in the Old Testament with Joseph when his brothers uh, sinned against him by selling him into slavery, right? God used that to prune Joseph so that he was ready to bear much fruit as the second in command in Egypt. So I think he can use uh, consequence to sin to, to prune us. Can, can pruning take away one of our idols? You know, if you have something in your life that, that is either neck and neck with God or, or kind of bumping Him down the, the pecking order on your time uh, for the day or the week or the year, um, God can use pruning to take that idol away. Um, can pruning draw us closer to Jesus? It can. Um, Sometimes when we're pruned, uh, we, we have a choice, right? We have a choice. Do I, do I embrace this pruning and draw close to Jesus, or do I get bitter and say, how could you allow this to happen in my life, right? What, what this text is teaching us is that we need to lean into that pruning um, and, and, and help it draw us closer to Jesus. Um, can pruning give us more time and energy to be fruitful? The answer is obviously yes, right? When uh, I'm not a horticulturist, but uh, I know that when you prune a tree, like an apple tree, uh, you take all these sucker branches off, and that allows more nutrients to get to the, the right place. So, so pruning, cutting stuff out that is, that is interfering with our ability to bear fruit, absolutely can make us more fruitful. And here's the question. Does pruning always have to be painful. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. I think many times it is, right? Many times pruning is painful for us, but it doesn't have to be. I think if we are locked in and understanding that this is how God 
uh, helps us to bring more glory to Him, that uh, it doesn't have to be painful. We can embrace it. And then the, the last one is that came to mind for me is, would the Father ever prune too deep? Would He ever prune too deep? What do you think on that? I don't think He would, right? I don't think He's going to prune us so much that we, we bear no fruit, right? We want to bear fruit. And so He's He's never going to prune us too deep. It may feel like it's too deep, right? <laughs> it's like, hey, wait a minute, this, is, this isn't what I had in store here. Um, <clears throat> but I don't think he's going to prune us too deep. Um, the question is, are you being pruned? Actually, that's not the right question. The question is, how are you being pruned? We know that you're being pruned because the Bible promises it. If you're bearing fruit, you're going to get pruned so that we can bear more fruit and bring him glory. Um, then in verse 3, uh, it says, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Um, and earlier that evening, it seems like a long time ago, but remember that earlier that evening, he was washing the disciples' feet. And there he said too, he said, um, you are already clean and you only need your feet washed except for, except for Judas. Um, but here he says, you're already clean, um, and the focus then quickly jumps to what it means to be clean. He says, remain in me, and I will remain in you. Last week, the focus was on love and obey, and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit would come in and make, our, make their home with us, and Jesus now is, is amping up the, the teaching, I think, because he's saying, okay, remain in me, in verse 4, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And it seems obvious, right, that 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 grapes cannot bear themselves, right? They need a vine. Um, It, but why is so? Why is he telling us this so many times? Remain in me, because I think we have a tendency to. When things are going well, or even if we're bearing fruit, we have the tendency to, pride sneaks in, and we're like, ooh, ooh, right? And, and, and we're, we're thinking we're doing this on our own. So God is constantly saying, no, you have to remain in me to bear much fruit. Um, and, you know, it's a lifetime uh, of, of progression. Uh, let me just back up here a sec, so I'm going to jump to this one. Um, we, start, we don't start out bearing much fruit, do we, right? We start out on the top. We start out with some fruit. Um, w- there's some love and obedience, and then we step out in faith, and we, we bear some fruit, right? And fruit, uh, to me, uh, is, is not just defined as uh, people c- uh, coming to faith, you know, at, at, our, at, our, at our knees here. Um, fruit can be anything. Fruit can be uh, being faithful in, in witnessing to someone, even if they don't, even if they reject. You're being fruitful by planting seeds, all right? Um, but it is a lifetime of progression. Um, God wants us to bring Him as much glory as we were made to. And um, He's going to take us through to, to, to prune, to bear more fruit, and to get to, to much fruit. Just think about it. Uh, The creator of the universe came down, took the wrath for our sin so that we can be forgiven and be connected to him. And then he says, go and bear fruit. Um, I just want to make this clear. Bearing fruit is not, does not mean that uh, it earns us our salvation. We are already saved. When we start to bear fruit up there, we are already saved. And this is in the response to that, that great gift, the free gift of salvation, that we then want to serve, serve our king. And what he does then is he continues to take us down uh, that progression to much fruit. Last year in Chronicles, uh, in Second Chronicles, it says, For the eyes, thir- chapter 13, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So God's looking for those that are committed to him, and he's going to help us to bear much fruit. Now, question seven tonight was an interesting one. Uh, it, 
It basically is this. Can people without love for Christ, who work for a good cause, live what God calls a fruitful life? I'll give you a hypothetical. There's a believer and an unbeliever. They work on a project together. Uh, They discover uh, uh, a major invention that saves millions of lives. All right? Did they both bear fruit? Fruit that will last? The Bible says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So we have the answer. Um, Only one bore fruit in that hypothetical example. Um, The unbeliever was not connected to the vine. That doesn't mean they can't do good things. Um, If you look at modern medicine, lots of modern medicine was discovered by unbelievers, and we're, a lot of us are benefits of modern medicine, and I'm thankful. Um, But they did not bear fruit for the king because they're not connected to the vine. Um, Not all of us can be a Billy Graham, uh, and if you know who Billy Graham was, he died a few years ago, but um, Billy Graham didn't start out bearing much fruit right? He started out being obedient to what God called him to do, and God pruned him and multiplied his ability to bear fruit to where he was um, bearing fruit um, where thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people came to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Um, So if you don't feel like you're bearing fruit or much fruit right now, I want to encourage you. You're coming to BSF, um, that's a very, very important step. You're coming to BSF to keep meditating on God's Word because in God's Word, we understand how we can be fruitful. And it is being part of the vine. Ask Him. Ask, ask the Lord, am I bearing, what kind of fruit am I bearing? How can I bear more fruit? Um, Psalm 1, uh, if you get a chance, I'm going to read it here, but Psalm 1 is just a, a wonderful uh, synopsis, and I think of, of how to bear fruit. And I just want to read it for you. It says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. Okay, there's a progression there. He doesn't, he doesn't, walk, with the, he doesn't walk with them, he doesn't stand with them, and he doesn't sit with them. So there's an avoidance of sin that um, <coughs> sorry, is part of bearing fruit, Um, And then it says this, it says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Day and night. He's going to be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, wither, whatever he does prospers. To me, that is an is a great psalm about bearing fruit. If we're meditating on the word day in and day out, um, we are going to be fed, and we're going to be more understanding of what that fruit is. The church is another great place to get fed. Um, we, we all should be members of a Bible-believing church. BSF is great, but we need to be part of that church because there's more accountability there in church, or should be, um, whether it's a small group in church uh, or whatever, um, we need to be part of that. Our small group, we meet on Sunday nights and we discuss the sermon. So do you think I'm paying more attention to the sermon if we're going to discuss it later? I think that that just helps us to be ready to be more fruitful. Uh, Colossians 3.23 says this, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not not for men, since you know what you will receive, an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. So we can bear fruit by being the best employee, even if it's a secular job or a secular company, being the best employee because we're working for the Lord. That means we're not complaining. That means we are doing our best, all right? Um, You got a bunch of menial tasks to do at home? Be the best at it. Don't complain. You're working for the Lord. Um, God's going to lead you to bear the fruit that He wants you to bear. And then in verse... uh, 7 and 8, we get this in tonight's text. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So if we're truly remaining in the vine, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, what do you think you're going to ask for? Probably not that new sports car, 
right? What are you going to ask for? You're going to ask for, how can I bear more fruit for you, Lord? How can I be more effective to bring you more glory? And he's going to give it to us when we ask. Verse 9 says this, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. Again, last week it was, it was if you love me, you will obey my commands. This week is, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. They're intertwined. Love and obedience are intertwined. Can we do it on our own? No, no. We need the Holy Spirit to help us do this. And then it gets to verse 11. Um, I have told you this uh, so that your, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Have you lost your joy recently? It's easy to do when we're looking at the world today, isn't it? I don't know about you, but this picture to me shows pure joy, right? Uh, unless you become, Matthew 18 says this, unless you become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So how do we come, become like little children? Well, we become humble. We depend on God 100%. We love Jesus unconditionally. And we let God be God. We come under his wing. Um, but I also think it's joy. It's okay to have joy. We had it when we were kids, right? Where do we lose it along the way? It's okay to be joyful in the Lord. And I think that when you are bearing much fruit, there's extreme joy in that. There really is. Um, and then in verse 12, he says that we're to love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus says, you're, not, you're, you're no longer slaves. You're my friends because um, you know what my master's business is. And we do know, right? We do know what his business was. And it was to die a brutal death so that we could live, be saved, and bear fruit for him. We are more than servants. We're friends. And then in verse 16, it says this. It says, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. See, back then, um, uh, rab, uh, students usually pick their rabbi, right? It's like, oh, okay, I, I want to be a, I want to, I want to follow this guy, right? Jesus says, no, I chose you, and he chose us as well, and he appoints us to bear fruit. It's not really an option. Um, we're to bear fruit. So the principle of this this first section is remaining in Jesus means getting pruned so that we can bear much fruit. Have you been pruned recently? Are you fighting to hang on to those things that, that suck up your, your energy and your time but really don't produce much fruit? Um, would you rather do some self-pruning before God does the pruning? I think remaining uh, in Jesus is key to everything. It's key to uh, identifying the idols in our lives so that we can, we can set them aside. Um, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So we need to do everything that we can within our power and the gifts given us to remain in Jesus. Because apart from him, we can do nothing. Um, remaining in Jesus means we have a direct link to a holy God. Hebrews 4 says that uh, we have a great high priest, and we know the curtain was torn in two, so we can go directly to the throne uh, room to present our requests. And I think our request should be to bear some fruit. God's faithful, and he's going to answer that. Um, the second division here is, guess what? We are going to get worldly opposition. Do you often compromise just to get along? If we, you see, if we don't go against the grain of popular opinion, maybe we won't offend anybody and nobody's going to be angry with us. Has someone ever gotten angry with you? Uh, not because you're a sinner or you, you sinned against them, but because you're a follower of Jesus. So far, we've heard time and time again that we are to love each other. But then we see this. We see that the world, in verse 18, hates you. Keep in mind that it hated me first, 
If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. After all that comfort that Jesus just brought with the bearing of fruit and the pruning and, and, and uh, you're call, calling his uh, disciples friends, he's being honest with them. He's saying, if the world hated me, they're going to hate you. Um, even if you're bearing much fruit, you're going to be hated. And <laughs> hate's a strong word, isn't it? All right? Um, but through time, we've seen it. In Matthew 24, uh, verse 9, it says, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. Almost all the disciples were martyred. That means they were killed for following, being a follower of Jesus. And it doesn't stop with the disciples. All through history, we see that the world hates Christians. Yet we, as believers, are called to love our enemies. It's another way we can bear fruit, right? We can love our enemies. Not easy, but it's a way we can do it. Um, verse 20 says this, No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, and they did, right? They will persecute you. If you obey my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. I think in modern-day America, uh, we get a false sense that the world doesn't really hate us as much as it did in the disciple time. Yet, no servant is greater than his master, right? Um, we certainly don't think we're greater than our master, Jesus. So, here's the question. Is it our worldly compromises that are maybe keeping us from being hated by the world? Um, it says here, it says, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. Does the world love you? It shouldn't. Um, we don't know uh, how persecution is going to come, um, and it really hasn't hit us. Um, and we're not supposed to seek it out. Matthew 10 says, um, when you are persecuted in, in one place, flee to another, right? Um, and then Jesus gets even to the more to the point. He says, whoever hates me hates my father as well. So, you ever been in a conversation uh, or maybe it's on social media or whatever, and, and, you know, it's okay to mention, yeah, I believe in God, right? Um, it's pretty, pretty uh, amiable. There's not a lot of tension there. But you bring the name of Jesus into the conversation, and things can get heated pretty quickly. Um, it says that if you reject Jesus, you reject the Father. The world, I think, is made up of a God of their own I guess, liking, right? Uh, maybe a, an old grandpa in the sky that doesn't rain on my fun or my sin parade. Uh, but bring Jesus into that discussion, and, and I think comes the hatred. Um, and this is, in verse 25 says this, this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. There was no reason to hate Jesus. Let's see. He fed thousands, right? He, he cast out demons. He healed their sick. He taught wonderful things. There was no reason to hate Jesus. But he didn't fit their pattern, did he? He ate with tax collectors and sinners. Um, so the leaders of the day willfully blinded themselves with hatred for both Jesus and his followers. And that passes through all the way to today. We are going to be hated um, if we're fruit-bearing, strong believers. Um, that's why I think he gave us, the doctrine tonight is the church, and we don't have a lot of time to get into it, but I think he gave us the church um, because he knew the world's going to hate us. And so we needed a safe haven to come to, right? We can get here at BSF as well. It's this safe haven where we can talk about how I can be more fruitful, talk about how I can be more faithful, um, in the context of other believers. And so the church is a gift that, that, that God gives us so that we can continually be fed and be ready and equipped to go out and do battle because that's what it is. It's, it's battle. So I just want to encourage you. I want to make sure that uh, BSF is a wonderful thing, and I am so glad you're here, but I want you to, if you're not part of a good, strong, Bible-believing church, um, 
I think you need to join one. Um, it's God's gift to His people. So the principle of this second section is the world will hate you because I've chosen you out of the world, out of this world. You know, we want it both ways. We want to be chosen <laughs> and not hated, right? Uh, but to be chosen out of this world is a wonderful thing, right? God shows us to be believing in Him. Uh, and let's not think we're greater than our Master. Um, do you have, let me ask this, do you have one foot in the world and one foot in with Jesus? If so, it might be time to get off the fence. Bearing much fruit for our Savior will drive worldly opposition. But Jesus is telling us ahead of time, so we're not surprised. We must keep our eyes on Him. Uh, stepping out in faith to bear fruit for Him will bring Him glory. And that's what we want to do, don't we? We want to bring Him glory. What a great God we have. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for uh, this lesson. Thank you that we are so loved by you that you chose us out of this world. You chose us to be fruitful for you. Help us to lean into that. Help us to, to do it with joy. Um, help us to do it with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, next week, seminar, 545. See you there. Have a great week.